Hi everyone, thanks for having me today. So I'm going to talk about uh, information in uh, various domains such as computer science, biology, human cognition, hum human communication. And I, my job is to convince you that a common notion of information can be used in all these uh, domains, which is maybe not obvious. Uh, as you know, we have several uh, uh, usual definitions of information, and uh, to my knowledge, no one has ever succeeded in uh, in applying the, this uh, defi these definitions to uh, uh, er in every situation in which we would like to talk about information. Uh, because we do have an intuitive notion of information, that we use, obviously, in uh, journalism. Uh, also, uh, when you need a piece of, of advice, when you need uh, to know how to uh, reach this place from Brussels Midi, you say, I need the, this piece of information. Uh, but you also use information when you talk about DNA. You say DNA does carry information. Uh, you use... Uh, information when you talk about uh, new neurosciences you say that the brain is processing information you know that cognitively you you do have an information you, do, you miss it uh, also we use it in evolution sciences okay because uh, genetic uh, information does evolve uh, and more broadly in biology and of course in language sciences, in which we talk about relevant information. Uh, and language is supposed to convey information. And of course, of course, in communication technologies, we are uh, dealing with transmitting information. So this year we are uh, celebrating the, the centenary of the birth of Claude Shannon who designed the, the first convincing definition of the notion of information. So he was born in uh, 1916. Uh, and, uh, but I will mention also a notion uh, that you know, of course, because uh, you had uh, uh, a talk last, uh, last month about this topic uh, that was building on the notion of conmogol of complexity. And this notion uh, is now something like uh, 50 years, uh, 50 years, 50 years old. So what can we do with all this? Can we uh, match the intuitive notion information using theoretical concepts? That's far from obvious. I will show you a few examples in which the match doesn't work. Um, just to mention a few intuitions that, uh, that Claude Shannon had, he said uh, something which was very unintuitive at that time, that, which was that information has, uh, has to do with coding. At that time, every transmission, every transmission of information was carried by analog, uh, analog devices. Uh, and it was very counterintuitive to say, no, we, it's a question of coding. It's not a question of modulating uh, the wave or something like this. Uh, of course, you know what Shannon's big idea was, that uh, noise doesn't uh, uh, destroy information. Uh, noise affects the rate of information, the, way, the rate at which you can transmit information but information can survive uh, to noise up to a certain limit. So this also was very counterintuitive. At that time, uh, noise wa was uh, perceived as uh, a danger to information and that uh, inf uh, okay, uh, information was damaged by noise. And it was, it, it, thanks to Shannon, we know it's not the case. And also, uh, Shannon based his notion of information on surprise. And when he was dealing with entropy, he was dealing with redundancy. So the question is, can we use this, uh, these notions and uh, save them in order to capture the intuitive notion and information? So maybe I will mention a few examples in which we want to use the concept of information. Uh, so just to mention that uh, with two colleagues, 
Uh, we recently published a book, which is called uh, in France Le Fil de la Vie. Uh, his colleagues are uh, Cédric Gaucherel, who is, who is an ecologist, and uh, Pierre-Henri Bouillon, who is a biologist, an evolutionary biologist. And uh, we have begun to have interesting conversation about information in biology. And of course, I knew everything about uh, Dawkins' selfish gene. And uh, I knew a lot about the information because I, I simulated uh, about evolution because I simulated evolution on my computer. I had done this for many years. But when we talked with uh, Cédric Gaucherel, he said, uh, "Oh, uh, you know what? In uh, ecology, uh, ecosystems are uh, processing information." Oh, we said, uh, "Strange," because we are used. Uh, uh, to look at ecosystems as uh, dynamic systems with uh, feedback loops, uh, analog uh, processes. You know the Lotka Volterra equations. That's typical of what is going on in the. Uh, uh, and uh, why bother about information in this case? And uh, yesterday night, I attended uh, uh, to, uh, uh, a talk by uh, some uh, guy, uh, Pierre Bricage. Uh, uh, was dealing with the information, uh, well not, not information, he was dealing with life and the definition of life and anything like this. He's a systemist. He presents him, uh, himself as a systemist, which means that he conceives of biology as a, a, a system with uh, feedback loops and, uh, uh, and action, reactions, and, and things like that. He said, uh, I don't need uh, to talk about information. I don't need that hypothesis. So the notion of information is, is disposable for people uh, coming from system theory. And that's it, uh, no problem, because it's all question of what we are talking about. And uh, in this case of life, it's a question of time scale. If you are dealing with short time scale, you are more uh, likely to use uh, system theory, feedback loops, and so on. If you are looking at a very large time scale, it's no point of looking at uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, systems. And uh, information becomes relevant, in this case, at a large time, time scales. And that's what Cédric Gaucherel told us. He said, OK, at a large time scale, when an inv invasive species like a wolf, say, the, the wolf, the story of the wolf in Yellowstone. The wolf has been um, uh, killed at the beginning of the 20th century in Yellowstone. So it has totally disappeared. And uh, at the end of the 20th century, so 70 years later, they try to reintroduce the wolf. And you can describe this as in, in terms of uh, population dynamics and look at what's going on. That's at the short term. If you are looking at the long term, you just say, OK, that's a binary decision. Either the wolf succeeds in uh, entering the, the uh, Yellowstone or not. And what uh, Cédric Gaucherel was saying is that you have a trophic network, trophic graph. Trophic means who is eating whom in, a, in an ecosystem. So it's a graph. I'll show you such a graph later. And he said the, the wolf species is reading the graph and making a decision whether it can enter the graph or not. I said first, this guy, this guy is crazy. And after discussing with him, I said, uh, oh, he has convinced me that he, he was right. Because at the time scale, everything happens as if the species wolf was reading the trophic net, uh, graph and making a decision. Okay. So there is kind of a match between a, a, a detection operation between the species and the graph. So can we describe life using this notion of uh, information in long term? Our answer is yes. So, sorry. Uh, so, the most immediate definition of information we have is uh, news. Okay, you buy uh, you buy newspapers, 
And we are told in by journalists that uh, dog, by ma uh, dog bites man is not a news, but man bites dog is a big news. Okay, that's a very famous aphorism. Uh, due to Charles Dana uh, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, what does it mean? So we, we know what it means. We, are, uh, we know what, uh, what uh, raises our interest. We know what we call information. That was very intuitive. What's the link with uh, Shannon's information? Not obvious. Okay. What's, what the link with Kolmogorov complexity? That's not obvious either. So I will show that there is a link, a very strong link. Uh, when we are dealing with brain, uh, we are also uh, dealing with information. This is an example of the binding uh, it, it, to illustrate the binding problem. You know about the binding problem in the brain. Uh, you, when you see shapes like this, okay, uh, these are processed in the brain uh, by their color, their position, their shape. And uh, the problem is that your brain is processing all this in separate uh, location. So how does your cortex know that uh, it is dealing with a unique object? In this case, how do you know that you are dealing with uh, a segment, an oblique segment here, uh, which is at this position, and a, uh, a, a, a circle, a half a circle there, at that position and not the converse, since it's processed in different parts of the, uh, of the brain. So that, this is called the binding problem. This has, uh, it remains a hard problem for, uh, in neuroscience to know how does a brain make, uh, build up unified representations of what it can see, for instance, can perceive. And uh, there are few answers to, to this problem. Uh, the one I know, and uh, my favorite one, has to do with uh, uh, neu uh, neuron synchron uh, synchrony, which means that se separate parts of the cortex dealing at a given moment with the same object are oscillating in synchrony. This is supposed to, to solve the binding problem, and it also uh, accounts for consciousness. <coughs> so to my knowledge, that's the best candidate as a neural co correlate of uh, consciousness. If you are interested in this, you might know better than me. But my favorite author about this is Christoph Koch. Uh, and you can uh, read about uh, experiments that can be done to uh, investigate this aspect of consciousness. A and it's used to solve the binding problem. And uh, when you deal with this, you are dealing with information. We are, you are dealing with detection. There is an information about the presence of such an object at such a location. And your brain is able to detect it. We are talking about information, of course, in computer science. And we are uh, also dealing with information in biology now that uh, we are uh, with the genome project uh, we are analyzing, uh, analyzing uh, uh, no longer the, 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 the DNA of a species, but the DNA of, of individuals. And even in, in one individual, uh, people are uh, analyzing the DNA of different cells, and they discovered that we are not uh, identical with ourselves. Yes, there are uh, somatic mutation early in embryogenesis, which make that we are chimera. Uh, Kim Chimera? Chimeras. Chimeras. So or, uh, it might be that the genotype of my right arm is not exactly the same as the genotype of my left arm. Okay. Mm. So that's we are so that's a huge quantity of information, and uh, we must deal with it. We store it, we analyze it, we do machine learning on it. All this is called information uh, without defining it. Okay. okay. Uh, be before def attempting to define information, let's observe that information may survive. That's, mm. By the way, that's the main point of the, of the book. Information may survive. Uh, you know this because, because uh, when you are dealing with what is called a gene, uh, 
most of the time people call gene what should be called a mutation or uh, what uh, people like John Holland call a schema. <coughs> but let's deal, with, uh, let's talk it to gene if you want. So, uh, and uh, the problem is to try, try if you have a gene that is rare, for instance, uh, can we trace uh, the origin of your gene? So we can look at your family, at your village, at your uh, country, at your or, or, uh, population you come from, try to find uh, whether your cousins, your brother cousins or uh, neighbors carry the same gene. And people are able, uh, and if, if it's not, in some t sometimes, sometimes we are able to trace the origin of the gene quite far back in the, in the past. I have an example, try to find it somewhere. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, I lost it. Uh, I, I, I must have it, oh yes, I got it. You know, in 2003, so more than 10 years ago, uh, a, 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 a mutation was found on the Y chromosome and it's known as a haplogroup CM217. Why is it interesting? Because it's very rare. Very rare, but uh, the people in, the, in Asia have it. And so it was the beginning of a, uh, of a, a DNA analysis. Uh, it was 60, uh, 15 years ago, no, 16 years ago. And people were uh, surprised by the fact that, so you know, uh, when it's carried by the Y chromosome, you you inherit it from your father. Okay. So question is, it cannot, it, it, it will spread through a population uh, by um, from uh, father to son. Okay. It's contra contrary to uh, mitochondrial DNA. So here it's from father to son on the Y chromosome. And people uh, draw the, the, uh, the map in which this rare mutation was found. And a colleague of the biologist came, uh, happened to, to come to the laboratory and said, oh, why well, do you have a, a, a map of uh, the Gengis Khan uh, empire? It's not Gengis Khan uh, empire map, it's uh, the map of the frequency of the CN217. Oh, strange! It <laughs> matches exactly the the, the map of the Genghis Khan Empire. So they made an investigation, and they came to the conclusion that uh, this mutation might originate from Genghis Khan himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Genghis Khan had a few children, but uh, one of his uh, sons had many, many children, may, uh, several thousand children. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 1,000 or more. Uh, of course, the story, uh, <laughs> you have to exaggerate the story. I don't know exactly the, the real figure. I'm not sure we know it. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the point is that uh, you, ha you can trace some piece of pieces of information back to famous people like James Khan. Uh, this is called coalescence. So coalescence time is the time uh, when you have, uh, uh, you are, uh, when the, you are able to join two genealogies uh, back to a common ancestor. So uh, this is a piece of information. It's living a long time. Observe that uh, such a piece of information is living much longer than individuals. So at this time scale, indi individuals vanish. If you look at the movie very fast, the only thing you see are genes or pieces of DNA that remain constant. Individuals are just, uh, just flicker, they, you don't see them. So it's pointless to talk about individuals. It's pointless to talk about dynamical system at this scale. What is uh, remaining, what is uh, uh, propagating is piece of information. It isn't irrelevant to talk about matter because in this case, uh, the, what you are interested in is not a specific DNA molecule. You don't care about the molecule. You care about the information it carries, what I uh, was displaying that way. 
this uh, sequence you are dealing with, uh, interested in A, G, G, C, T, G, C, G, A, G, and so on. That's relevant. Everything else is irrelevant. So in this case, matter is irrelevant. Information is relevant. That's why you had this subtitle on the book uh, about the imm immaterial uh, aspect of life. Uh, of course, we are materialists. Matter, uh, information only exists if it's written on matter. But matter is, is irrelevant at that scale. Uh, to have an, an example, uh, you know that uh, Craig Venter, uh, where is it? Uh, Craig Venter, uh, a few years ago, was um, able to, to, to build from scratch, not from scratch, but he analyzed, he anal with his team, he, he analyzed uh, a DNA molecule of more than uh, one million nucleotides. And it took it from uh, a bacterium, which is uh, mycoplasma, and it took it. it anal uh, analyzed, they analyzed the DNA sequence, and then they put it on a computer. On the computer, they inserted new information, such as their own names, uh, a famous quotation by uh, Richard Feynman, and so on. And they made, a, they synthesized a new DNA molecule which is a feat, big feat, because uh, uh, it, it over one million nucleotide uh, don't make an error. So they were able to synthesize that molecule and to insert it not into the same species, but into a cousin species of the initial one. And then the, the, the new bacterium was living. So you have uh, a donor who gave its DNA. The DNA was transplanted into silicium on the computer. Then it was changed. And when then it was inserted into, a, how you call it, a surrogate mother, which was a new, the other bacterium. And after a, new gen, a few generations, the new, the, the bacterium was much more like the donor than like the, the surrogate mother. So it's not, uh, they didn't synthesize life. You could claim that a lot of information was still in the cytoplasm. So we don't, no, no one says that they, uh, they take, took all information defining the living being and synthesized it. No, but a, a very relevant part of it, yes, which was the DNA. Okay. And they reprogram it by inserting some information that they have chosen themselves. Yes. So they, they uh, took away the, the chromosome. You say chromosome from the surrogate uh, bacteria, and they put the, the chromosome, uh, the synthesized chromosome in it, and it worked, okay. which is a feat. It won't work with the uh, eukaryote, I would say, or there is a lot of work to do to, so to achieve it. So we wonder if after several generations, whether those inserted things like their names at the, yes, at the time and whether they were still there. Yes, yes, they were still there. There is no problem in bacteria because uh, when you put something in chromosome, it lasts for very long because there is no crossover with, uh, crossover is not so often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does happen uh, because you do have uh, Phenomena like uh, con conjugation, how do you call it? Yeah. When uh, another bacteria gives its chromosome, and you have crossover. But uh, okay, but it, it can survive crossover f during a few generations. Yeah, but I suppose it, if it would be many generations, and there would be mutations, mm -hmm. then probably it would disappear. Some interesting information for the bacteria would eventually disappear. Exactly. Yeah. Because natural selection is no longer exactly. Find one good. Okay. Sure, the, 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 uh, of course. But the, the point that they were able to have a functional bacteria that was much like the original one. And it was in, sorry, I, I forgot to, so it's in the book, it was a few years ago. I, I would say f f less than five years ago. Can you repeat the name of the? Craig Venter. Oh, or you can count me here. Yes. <laughs> Craig Venter. Sorry. Uh, okay, here we have something that is living for a long time, 
I have a demo about this, but we, I don't, I'm not sure it's relevant. Um, here we have a path. A path, imagine that it's a forest and uh, you have a path. And if you run this program twice, you, you get, end up with different paths. How does it work? The point that when you have to walk in the forest, uh, you prefer, you, you have a, a global target. You know you want to go uh, northeast. But at the same time, you want to have an easy way. So if you see that someone already traced a way in front of you, you prefer, you have a compromise between uh, easy way and global, uh, global uh, direction. And if you run the program several times, you get different results because uh, local uh, accidents are amplified by the fact that newcomers prefer to uh, to, to go the same, uh, to, through the same path. So we have something which is pretty much like what Jacques Monod called uh, as a chance and hazard. Okay, Chan mm -hmm. uh, chance and necessity, sorry. Hazard and necessity. Chance and necessity. Chance is mutation. What is mutation here? Ah, for whatever reason, you uh, try an, a new way. For instance, here you decide to go not to make the, the detour here and try to take your chance that way. It would be a mutation. And you have necessity, which is uh, reinforcement of known solutions. It's also called the compromise between exploration and exploitation. And this leads to different solutions. But the point is that under certain circumstances, which means the mutation rate is low enough, then you have a very long-term memory of uh, solutions. Some of, the, uh, of our, our roads in Europe uh, are, can be date, dated back to Romans. And they are not optimal for our cars. Uh, they were optimal because at that time, because they didn't want to have to uh, uh, to sloppy roads, but now that we have powerful cars, we don't care. But anyway, <laughs> we make long, uh, uh, many turns just because Romans decided to do so. So it's a very conservative system, which means that in this kind of information is long lasting. And I call it information again. Uh, and this, uh, you know, haha. <laughs> Does it English? Uh, 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 can I say this in English? Tatin, tart, tatin. Tart, tatin. But everyone knows the concept. You know this kind of tart that is cooked upside down. And it was discovered at the, by the end of 19th century. Oh, two weeks ago I uh, had dinner with uh, uh, friends, and uh, the, the woman said. You know that my grandmother knew the discoverer, knew one of the, one of the two sisters who discovered the tatin, tatin tart. And uh, she said, so I said, tell me about the, 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 the real story. <laughs> what happened? Because it, it's claimed to be an error at the origin. So in the book, I, I tried to, uh, to reinvent the story. But uh, no one knows for sure. Uh, the grandmother is dead, unfortunately, so maybe she can ask her cousin. I will know in a few, a few weeks, maybe. The point is that this recipe is well known, at least in France. And this recipe uh, had, uh, uh, is very long lasting. Some of the recipes are, if you go to a, uh, a bakery, no, a bakery. bakery. bakery you see always the same uh, cakes. Uh, many more than if you go to a Starbucks coffee, of course. But many more, but the inventory is not infinite. So always they are famous. I, I would suspect it must be a poor law. <laughs> so there are the cakes that are everywhere. Croissants are always present. And uh, shibuts are maybe less, uh, less frequent, but they are still frequent, which means that there are recipes we are, which are transmitted and which are successful. Okay. We call it, uh, so some people call it MEMS, uh, after Richard Dawkins, who made the analogy with genes. And so my tartan tart is just here to remind us of the memetics. 
and to uh, say that memes are also pieces of information that long uh, that, that are long lived. Okay. Uh, the other uh, image is uh, about uh, so it's a well, very well known story uh, uh, about uh, uh, I have it somewhere. Uh, I, I am looking for names, but uh, you know it's uh, the ability to uh, digest uh, lactose here. So uh, yes, his name is Mark Thomas. He, he published uh, 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 two or three years ago uh, a, a new map of the frequency of, uh, um, of mutations that enable you to uh, digest lactose when you are an adult. And this is a well-known uh, case because it's an example of interaction between culture and genetics. It's a meme gene interaction because this uh, gene was only uh, advantageous in populations which were uh, raising uh, cattle. But it has such a success that it spread over the world in a few centuries. No more than uh, a few millennia, but almost centuries. So we know about the speed of uh, progression. So the, it's in white here. The, the whiter, the more frequent. By the way, there are several such mutations. Uh, the European one comes from Middle East. There is an African one and uh, Middle East one. Okay. So here you have, so in the north of France and I guess in uh, Brussels, uh, nearly 100% peop of people can digest lactose when they are adults. If you go to uh, Botswana or, uh, or in uh, southern uh, China, uh, nearly no one can uh, digest lactose uh, as an adult. This is an example of a piece of information which is genetic, but we, uh, um, we could uh, survive only because there was a cultural habit which was a, a, a surviving information at the cultural level, which was the habit of raising cattle. Uh, okay, next point is that information not only is long-lived, but information is selective, maybe selective, which is that the long-lasting pieces of information we observe today is very, very likely to have survived a strong selection. More than that, I would say that the only thing which has been selected is information. So I hope I am a little bit uh, uh, raising a little a few issues here, because uh, the natural consequence is to consider that what is uh, what is uh, what natural selection is about is information. Natural selection is not about living beings. Uh, we are not surviving. It's not a question of survival of strongest, because we are not. We are all dying. It's pointless to, to talk about survival. What uh, uh, survival is about, about information in the long term. And you can apply it to path in the forest. You have alternative path, and one of them will be winning, because it's a winner take all mechanism. And you can talk about allele path. The alleles are alternative paths that are competitors, and only one will survive. So that's the point of uh, talking about struggle for life. Struggle for life applies to information, it, to nothing else. Struggle for life applies to cake recipes, because uh, uh, you have one way of uh, making a tata and, and a, a closely related recipe will die by competition, even if it might be better because there is a strong, it's very conservative system. And of course, our ability to digest lactose was highly selected in, uh, in our cultures. So it's a selection uh, at the expense of the allele gene which was an, a gene that said, OK, you di digest lactose when you are a child, and then you, you have to, do, to get rid of, uh, of milk because you have to find your own food. So it's very advantageous, advantageous 
not to digest uh, lactose anymore in a normal population. But in population uh, who are raising cattle, it became even more uh, advantageous to uh, digest lactose. Of course, it was not the, the milk of your mother that you were digesting, but uh, the milk of cows or... Uh, at what time does the lactose tolerance disappear? Uh, this, uh, okay, I, I for, I, in the book it's written, but I, I just forgot to, to write it. Uh, see, yes, I got it. Uh, 7,500. I know, but I mean in an individual. Uh, so children can be digested. Uh, at what time? Uh, around uh, six, uh, five or six, maybe. Yes, and, uh, yes it's gradual. Yeah. Maybe it's starting at two or two or three, uh, and uh, it's certainly present at uh, the and the, the mutation is supposed to have occurred uh, only uh, 7,500 years uh, ago, presumably in Hungary, uh, for our mutation in Europe. Oh, this is uh, okay. This is an illustration uh, illustration of uh, two things: uh, Dawkins selfish uh, selfish gene, and also the schemata as uh, John Holland calls them. So I just show you what it's based on. It's very, oh, nothing happened. Yes, it was slow. Um, I don't know if I do this, maybe it works. I don't remember what I, what I left there, probably. The, the, it's just a, a what is called a, a genetic algorithm. You know the techniques, I guess. Uh, genetic algorithm is a way technique to, uh, that reproduces uh, Darwinian selection in the computer uh, with uh, a, pop a population of what we call an individuals. And each individual is uh, characterized by, by its DNA, what we call DNA, which is a binary vector. So here I can zoom in. No, yes. So here we have uh, each each, uh, each line here, a pixel line, is, an, is the DNA of one individual. What you see is random because at the start here I decided that the population would be random. So all my individuals are identical. And then I ask the individual to, to, to solve a problem, which is to find the exit in the, the maze here, in the labyrinth, yeah, to find the exit. So here, you have uh, some individuals w w which are exploring. Okay, and you can see that there are vertical vertical lines in the in the genome of the population. That's just because individuals becomes become correlated. They become cousins. So things are cousins are reproducing with each other. You see that they are correlated, and so you see vertical uh, correlations. But remember that the DNA is displayed horizontally. And after a while, obvious, uh, hopefully, it will find an exit. Oh. So I, I have to fine tune the, yes, here. Up. Okay, and we got an exit. We are happy. Okay, so you can observe that here we have uh, uh, more or less random positions. For instance, here you have very random positions. Half of the people have a one and the other half has a zero. But here you have, everyone has a, a, a black, uh, something black, which corresponds in this case, because I know how it's coded, it corresponds to this segment. So here you have to go to the right. And it's very important for individuals to have uh, 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 the correct uh, way to to follow. Okay, so uh, does it make sense? In this case, you have evolution and evolution. I am just looking at the genome of the population. Remember that individuals are displayed horizontally, and the vertical bars just come from the fact that individuals are correlated. They are like uh, brothers or first cousins. And so if but, I uh, the criterion is that if they make detours, the fitness is slower. Uh, in this case, yes. Uh, the evaluation function, once they found an exit, the evaluation function 
depends on the length of the path. So if they make a detour, detour, the path will be longer, they are losing points. Because on the buzzer there's still so much variation because there's clearly one shorter spot. Yes. Uh, by the way, it's not the sh totally short yet here. They can evolve. So it all depends how you, uh, uh, well, I design it to be quite, a, uh, to explore a lot. Okay. So some of the last mutation has to be discovered uh, maybe I have a mutation rate which is too high, but you, you can see that the average fitness in population is still increasing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if I rerun the, the program, it might find another, uh, another exit. Uh, by the way, there are two obvious exits here. So the, the, the exit uh, at the bottom is, I am not remember if it's, one of them is one, one uh, step uh, shorter than the other one. So in this case, he's has he, he trouble finding an exit. Can find cycles. Here, it could find the same exit. Okay. Uh, I have a, a, another way of running it. So it's just to say that um, it all, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, let's try with these settings. In this case, I'm not uh, exploration is not that much uh, rewarded. What is rewarded is just the fact that you don't want your system to yes, you don't want your system to make U turns. You don't want your system to make bumps into wall. Into walls. And this is interesting. This is what I wanted. Here we have a system which is perfectly happy. No U-turns, no bumps into walls because it found a cycle. <laughs> and of course, we have God's eye. We know that there is a better solution. But the, the species doesn't know it, doesn't care. Okay? So here we have a perfect, uh, perfect race. <laughs> Until there will be maybe uh, Adam or Eva. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we will uh, we will find an exit. So we are, you have to wait a long time, maybe. Uh, sometimes I keep it running. I am on the okay. So I could uh, keep it running, and eventually it will find the solution. Mm. What we call a solution because we have God's eye. In reality, for living species, there is nothing like good uh, perfect solutions doesn't make sense. Okay. So you see, you see the point here. But you, you so this is story um, as we, you would tell uh, it uh, from an engineering point of view. You want to find a solution. But you can tell it from the DNA point of view. You could say what does my uh, how can I describe it if I look only at the DNA of the, of the population. Okay. Uh, this is DNA of the population. What's going on here? So I, I had a lot of noise at some points, uh, uh, and some places our location is very stable. And uh, so I have winners, I have losers. Who are the winners? The pieces of information that code for the cycle. Mm. These are the winners. Not etern eternal winners, because if the system is able to find an exit, the former winners will be the new losers. Okay. And uh, I may pay attention to the struggle for life between all these pieces of information. This is exactly what John Holland proposed to do uh, 50 years ago in 65. He says, John Holland said, what you should pay attention to are partial specification of the genome. <coughs> so. For computer scientists, it will be a mask. You look at certain location, and uh, so you can count how many you have in a population, and they are all, so you have alleles, you have alleles. So if you have here, for instance, you say here, I want a zero, a one, a one, and I don't care about all other positions. Here I have, the gen generalization of a selfish gene, which is a selfish 
schema. So what are the alleles of such a schema? The alleles are all the other schema that occupy the same locations. So where the, the same locations are specified. So here I may have a one, one, one. This is an allele. There, uh, there is struggle, uh, struggle for life because the two cannot coexist on the same individual. So you must choose. If one prevails, the other one disappears. How many do you have here? You have eight of them. Because you, have, you can specify, here I decided to specify only three locations. So struggle for life is uh, uh, a question about uh, schemata. So this is schema. The order is three. And uh, what uh, John Holland tells us is that uh, the, they are in competition and that the living species is processing in parallel many schemata like this. And you can, well, his point is that if you have a population with n individuals, you can, the system will process up to n to three schemata. So here, so if here we almost had uh, an exit, you know, uh, here, but uh, they just found the exit by chance, and they were unable to to um, to, to leave it to, to their children. So uh, we have to wait a long time until uh, an exit is found. Okay, so let's see. So here I ask you to mentally rotate by uh, 90 degrees, and imagine that the best individual of each generation is displayed vertically this time. So you see at the beginning it's very pr pretty much random. And then you can see that the cycle is discovered here, maybe another cycle here, and eventually an exit is found. So you b the, the winning schemata are displayed, you can see them. It's a way of visualiz visualiz visualizing all the schemata. And you can see who is winning when. And I run for a different run, you may have a different solution. Here is the exit uh, on the top that has been found, and here it was the exit at the bottom. So you can see the, the fate of pieces of information. You can look at living species that way, if you could. You could say living species are just uh, an arena in which schemata are struggling for life. Mm -hmm. So it's totally different way of looking at uh, life. Uh, this is uh, the point of uh, Dawkins to say that we are just envelopes, temporary envelopes for uh, long-lived genes or schemata and here individuals just are just living uh, during one, uh, one or two uh, pixels. Okay. In the long term, what is surviving are uh, pieces of information that go, that go through us. Okay. So what you mean by the schemata is that there are a whole bunch of points that actually can mutate without making any change to the fitness? Uh, some, for most of them, yes, but uh, that it was not the point. The point is that uh, if one of them is, uh, is selected, uh, for most of them it's not selected, so they will co co occur in different individuals. But if one of them is, has high selective value, it will invade the population and the other one will disappear. So you can, uh, uh, so if it's neutral, if they are neutral, both of them, they can coexist more or less in the population. But what I mean is the, the asterisk, so the, the position of the uh, the, 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 asterisk. No, no, it's just a question of observer. The, 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 the star is, I'm not looking at this for this definition of schema. But then I can say I, I'm looking at uh, something like this. This would be another schema, which is not an allele with this one. I would say, so it's. Uh, Okay. For instance, it would be compatible with that one, I guess. Okay. So they are not in competition. So it's, it's not the same competition. You have ha, ha, you have um, um, okay. 
the number of competition, different competitions uh, you are uh, looking at depends on which location you are specifying. So here are one competition, here another one, another one. You have many of them. It's so just it's question. Not a competition between individual points in the genome, but between its schematic and its Yes, you could conceive it as being a generalization of mutation. When you talk about mutation, it's one point mutation. Mm -hmm. And it's in competition, for instance, blue eyes with uh, brown eyes, and you can This is just a generalization. To say, though, I'm not looking only at one location in the DNA, but maybe two or three, or five, or ten. But I suppose you would typically have combinations that work together to yes. form a whole. And yes. Then it's a problem. It's not always obvious what's, what works yes. together and what. The point is to capture this kind of correlation. Yeah. That uh, uh, two uh, two mutations are only made uh, are successful if they are, if they are together. Yeah. This is what you want to capture with the DNA. And of course, uh, the schema cannot be too long. Otherwise, it will be cut by crossover with high probability, and you cannot follow it through generations. It cannot be too much specified. Otherwise, it, be, it will be destroyed by mutation quite probably. So it all depends on the length through time at which you want to look at your schema. And if it's, it is short enough and not too much instantiated, then you can uh, follow it through generations. So, uh, at least if you are uh, if you are uh, good as we are when you, we are dealing with genetic algorithms. I'm still wondering where does all the variation come from in your program, given that phenotypically, if we look at the screen, we always see the same parts. But yes. Still, there is a lot of uh, variation in the in the genome. So the the point is that most locations are neutral. Some of them are neutral because they code, they code for locations in which no one will ever go. Ah. And some uh, locations are coding for locations in which uh, virtually no one goes. They could go there, but they, they don't. So at a given moment, most of the locations are just, new, are just neutral. Ah, so the, the, the genome actually does not code just for the part, but what you would do if you would be in that Yes, part. in this case, that, that's the coding that was uh, used. Uh, alternative coding. Uh, this one is, is the most stupid, but uh, it's the one that works best. Okay. So if I'm waiting long enough, it will find eventually the solution. And that means that the black lines which don't change are probably the ones that are coding for the solution. Yes, the, the current solution. solution. But I I were, uh, if I were lucky enough, you would see that the switch to another solution, if it is able to find the exit, the switch is very fast at that scale. Yeah. To uh, scale uh, uh, our lives, it's very long. It could take 10, 20 generations, but at this speed, it's instantaneous. Yeah. That's why we are not interested that much in the dynamics of the system. We are just interested in the switch. Who is winning? It's, uh, another illustration of the punctuated That's exactly the phenomenon of punctuated equilibrium. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, and, and in this case, we can verify that, because originally uh, Stephen Jay Gould said uh, Darwin was wrong. Uh, we have the uh, jumps. And by the way, I showed to my students that uh, Darwin was right and Gould was right. It's just a question of time scale. At a large time scale, Darwin is tot um, um, Gould is totally uh, right to say that nature makes jumps. But if you zoom in a lot, you see that all intermediary forms do exist, but they are just living in a few generations, which is nothing. So the, the uh, um, assumption that evolution is steady is totally wrong. Evolution is very fast and slow at the same time, because it's very fast when there is selection pressure, and then it is in a uh, local mo uh, minimum like this. So sorry, I shouldn't talk too much about this because I'm dealing with information today. <laughs> <laughs> so I said information is selected, so you got the point. But my next point is to say that information uh, only exists if it is read. It must be read to be uh, called information. So that's bad news because you could say, OK, you, you need a, a human being or a scientist. Maybe not. So uh, let's uh, have a look uh, 
I'm coming back to the trophic network of my colleague Cédric Gaucherel. Uh, can you say that the trophic, the trophic network, is it, is it a piece of information? If it's only for scientists, you could say, okay, for a scientist, for the ecolo ecologist, it's a piece of information, yes, but that's not very interesting. But is it a piece of information for the wolf? I said the species wolf is reading the trophic network to decide whether uh, it could, can enter the ecosystem or not. And uh, uh, the point is that if, it's, if the species is able to perform that reading, you must consider that it is a piece of information, almost by definition of, uh, of reading. You, you read something which is a piece of information. Uh, so it has the two characteristics of being long-lived and as a consequence of being selected. Oh, the next steps would, to say, would be to say about ecosystems that, uh, some ecologists claim this, that uh, trophic, the trophic networks that we do observe have been selected against their alleles. Okay? They are more stable than alternatives. And we, you, we could say there are alternatives. By, uh, for instance, you, you switch one species for another. So that's for trophic species, uh, trophic network. You could have for the uh, uh, path network for many things like this, and um, you could have the same about DNA. Who is reading DNA? We say there is information in DNA because, as scientists, we are able to read this information. But we are not the only ones. Ribosomes are able to read information on the DNA. That, uh, that's well known. It was a big discovery in the 60s to say that DNA was read, read by a machinery called the ribosome. That's incredible. Read three by three, and you know the story. Uh, so question is, can we use uh, usual definition of information to account for all these phenomena? Uh, yes and no. So uh, we have problems with this, uh, both definitions that I mentioned on this slide, uh, Shannon's definition of information and uh, Kolmogorov complexity. We have a problem. So this is a, a successful attempt given by my colleague uh, Gaucherel to account for the local uh, diversity in uh, landscape. So you can perform a measure of entropy, local entropy, with a sliding window. You, you measure local entropy, which uh, measures the local diversity of, uh, uh, in the landscape. And then you can have a map of local uh, diversity. Uh, what measure of diversity do you use? Uh, here, entropy. Yeah, yeah, but first you need a, a distribution. So the distribution is just the local uh, frequency of different uh, types of soil. Ah, soil. That's soil, sorry. Uh, it's supposed to, I don't know the details, but it's supposed to be uh, uh, what is called agroforestier. So I uh, can you translate this, I'm not sure. So it's a mixture between forest and uh, agriculture. So you have different types. And uh, they know that different species can invade uh, depending on the local diversity, or they can correlate the local diversity with the uh, occupancy by certain uh, species, animal or uh, not animal species. And they want to make predictions and say that these species are able to read local, uh, local diversity. Uh, but uh, historically, I was. Uh, why? I was very much interested by Shannon's uh, definition of information. You remember uh, man bites dog. Man bites dog, it doesn't occur often. Okay. But dog bites man, it's very often. And you could say, I'm using Shannon's definition, and uh, if it's probable, it's not news. If it's improbable, it's news. So uh, basic, uh, Shannon's basic definition is information is the logarithm of improbability. Okay. And uh, I stick to that definition for a long time. I was very really happy. 
I even uh, wrote papers about this. I regret it a little bit now because it's wrong. It doesn't work. I had plenty of problems. So I introduced, I, 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 for independent reasons, I was interested in Kolmogorov complexity. These independent reasons are uh, here. It has to do with the em emergence. So you know about emergence. I have a, maybe a d small demo here, maybe. Uh, it's Shelling's experiment, you know, the, the most famous one about the emergence. Uh, you have uh, people, uh, you have a red and, uh, and blue. I don't know, well, okay. Red and blue here. And you just say that people are uh, racist, but not that much. <laughs> so they accept to be, uh, to live in uh, districts in which, so it has nothing to do with Brussels. So uh, it, uh, you accept to live in a district in which you are surrounded by uh, um, uh, at least half, peop uh, half the people are like you. Okay, so you are quite tolerant you would uh, tolerate something like 40 people, 40% 40 people different. Okay. What happens? And then when you are surrounded by more than 40 people uh, which are I don't know, less than 40 people who are like you or more than 60% people that are different from you, and then you move. What happens? Shelling Schilling, uh, got the Nobel Prize not only for this, but it's famous. Uh, that's the most famous experiment. <coughs> he was explaining uh, the segregation in the United States. And he said, people are not racist, but what happens is this. After a while, people move when they are unhappy, and then you get complete segregation. So at the collective level, people appear to be 100% uh, ra racist, which is not uh, reality at individual level. They are not that much racist. Of course they are racist because they pay attention to it. But uh, at the collective level, you, you see this. And this is a case of emergence. You have something which is true at the collective level, which is not, not true at the individual level. We know plenty of examples of this. In, my, in the picture here, I had the, the starlings uh, flying. Uh, and you pay attention to the cloud, and the cloud seems to have uh, a life on its own, as if uh, the cloud was taking decision. Of course, not uh, just it's just uh, uh, the collection of individual birds. And um, so, uh, to account for this, we provided a definition in '97 of, uh, of emergence as complexity drop. So, complexity understood as Kolmogorov complexity, which means size uh, of a minimal description length or size of the best summary. So uh, you understand that you have complexity drop in the case of shelling, because here you just have to describe the situation, you just have to, 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 to draw the frontiers. Uh, at the beginning, you have to decide for each pixel, you have to say the color. So that's a lot of bit, uh, many bits of information. Here, one bit by, by pixel. Here, you don't just need to to indicate the frontiers. So you have complexity drop. You need much less bits to describe this figure as compared to a random image. And so you have complexity drop. Complexity drop seems to be characteristic of all situations in which people talk about emergence. So I have a controversy about this with Jean-Paul Delahaye and, uh, and other people. Uh, but uh, my point is that uh, this is the correct definition of emergence unless you play with the word emergence. I take emergence to what people uh, call what emergence. What about defining it as uh, block and entropy? Hmm? What about defining it as block and entropy? With entropy? Yeah. So um, um, entropy, uh, in this case, it might work. There are many cases in which, uh, so I show you uh, other examples in which entropy uh, cannot work. The, the coincidence is when you have statistics, when you have numbers. So the two two notions might converge. Entropy is just a particular way of compressing information. You eliminate statistical redundancy. Kolmogorov complexity says you eliminate redundancy whatsoever. Doesn't say how to, pr to do it, but it says eliminate redundancy. So entropy is just a very specific case in which you have statistical redundancy and you are able to eliminate it. Uh, thanks to a new coding. But the, the two are, 
Shannon is, is about coding. Kolmogorov well, complexity is about coding as well. So the two notions are neighbors. And uh, in this case, uh, as compared to entropy, uh, complexity says you eliminate any redundancy you might find. Kolmogorov complexity. And Kolmogorov complexity, as so people say Kolmogorov complexity is not computable, uh, you know, probability is not computable as well. That's a, that's a pointless discussion because people, uh, when you compute uh, com probability, you deal with sets. And you need to have a computable membership uh, function for the set. And most of the time, mathematicians don't care about this problem. They say, oh, you can just consider the probability of what? Where does it come from? How you compute com probability? Okay, this is pointless. Uh, we can come back to it later if you want. So the point we, you, we defined, uh, we can define Kolmogorov co complexity in a resource-bounded way to say that that's the best compression you were able to achieve up to that point. So it's not ma machine independent. You have an observer, so it depends on one machine. And up to a point, uh, maybe five seconds later, it will be uh, able to make much better uh, compression. We don't care because it's, it's in the future. We are uh, embedded in a system which is able to observe emergence. I don't know if you, you know ste stereograms. You know, this kind of, uh, it's very really nice. You see, um, not all people are able to do it, but you see something, uh, you just need, a p you see something which is more or less a, a noisy pattern, a periodic pattern, and you are told to look uh, as if you were looking behind. And after a while, you, something pops up I I in 3D. You know, it's not fashionable anymore, but it was uh, 20 years ago, it was very fashionable. And uh, in this case, you can say there is emergence. Because at the beginning, it's noisy. And after a while, you see a pattern that you didn't see before. And it uh, suddenly makes sense. It makes sense. So uh, in this case, you have, uh, again, compression, because you have something which was, was complex, which is no longer complex. Uh, so I said you need an observer. And the point is that if I say you need an observer which is not human, you say, oh, you think a, a ribosome is uh, reading common model of complexity? Mm. Uh, I come back to ribosome later, but what about ants? These are ants studied by Susanna Resnikova. Uh, I forgot to um, remember Formica sanguinea, I guess, is the species. So you put them in a maze like this, and you put, so there are big ants, remember that one? <laughs> okay, big ants, <coughs> they are trying, so one after the other, there are not many of them in a colony. One of them is put on the maze, it will travel randomly, as far as we know, it will find a food item, a food source, and come back to the nest. When it comes back to the nest, the researchers remove the maze and replace it by an identical one, just to be sure that there is no pheromone. Uh -huh. And then they observe, in this species, they talk a lot to each other. You did, did, did observe ants uh, when you were kids. You know, say ants are talking to each other with antennas. And we don't know how it works. Just a while, the new ant, the informed one, will go through the maze and find the location. So at some point in the, in, in the paper, they compare the time it takes for an informed ant as compared to a random uh, walk, and it, uh, it's 10, 10 times faster. So it's very, it works. So we don't know anything about the code they use, but they, uh, we are sure they are using a code. And more than that, the time of the conversation, so are you ready, you are sitting, huh? okay? The time uh, of the conversation, is depends on the complexity of the location. So it's a, it's a, so you have here the time in seconds of conversations. If you have to 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 go uh, right, 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 it lasts for 80, 88 seconds, which is quite long. But if it's more complex pattern like uh, this one, light, make a uh, left, right, left, left, right, left, it takes 200 seconds. <laughs> so <laughs> I, have problem, I have a problem with this paper by Susanna uh, Reznikova, because for me, it should be the front page of nature. And it has been published in a very 
well, not very well known uh, uh, journals. Maybe because a different the culture, they are studying in uh, in Russia, so I don't know the story. So I, it seems to me to be correct, uh, correct research. Uh, if you look in the book, I give the, the, the references. You can find her on the web, and you can download the papers and make your own decision. It's very in impressive. How are these patterns uh, classified in terms of Kolmogorov uh, uh, I don't know, simplest one first, I guess. And uh, does it fit? Uh, and use a uh, compressed uh, language? Ah, oh, to, to compress uh, complexity. They did it by hand. But uh, you can check it with the. Uh, there, there are now ways of computing uh, more or less objective complexity. Uh, so you, you, you try to find a coding. And try. I did it for a lottery. I did my own compressor. You can have a reasonable es uh, estimate of the complexity. But the point is that. Uh, their point is to have an ordinal, ordinal comparison of complexity. So we would consider that uh, this pattern is more complex than the repetitive one, because the, the minimal description length of L, 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 L is shorter than L, R, L. This is more or less uh, uh, six bits. We can say it's six bits. The point is to find a coding in which this is less than six bits. So you code for the operation. It's so a very interesting exercise. To, it would be very interesting to reverse engineer Yes. Engineers yes. Engineers see how and so, by the way, uh, okay, um, we, we we could enter. Um, you know, um, it's very interesting to to have specialized discussions about this because uh, it's about Kolmogorov complexity, the original one, not prefix three. It's delimited by spaces <coughs> because we are uh, one bit is relevant. <laughs> okay, one or one bit more or less is very important. So we need a coding which is uh, very uh, reasonable and. Uh, so, and you're right, it would be nice to reverse engineer what's going on <laughs> in, uh, in the, the, in the ant, uh, ant's brain. So I hope it's not fake. Uh, I would say that if it was fa a fake research, uh, we would know by now, because uh, it has been published 10 years ago. Right? Okay. So we have a problem with Kolmogorov complexity. We have a problem with uh, Shannon's definition as well. The prediction with these definitions of information is that, uh, oh, sorry, I'm very talkative. So I have to be very fast now. Uh, th the prediction would be that random DNA has maximal information, which is definitely not what we want. Okay, To us, random DNA has no information whatsoever. It's pointless to claim that random DNA carries information. It's not interesting. So we have a problem here. So uh, I know that some people like Jean-Paul Delay, probably you, you would claim that the correct uh, concept would be uh, logical depth, because random DNA has no logical depth. Uh, that's another discussion that we can have afterwards. Uh, my point is that random DNA had no information. Uh, we, we need uh, some another definition of the information. And my proposal is to use a definition which is refers to complexity drop. We already saw complexity drop when we are dealing with emergence. Mm. So we don't need one measure of complexity, we need two. I come back to, uh, so this is my uh, story about uh, the lottery. It all did. It all began that way. I was with a student on a, on a whiteboard, and we said, "Okay, Shannon, Shannonian definition works very well, but in one case, lottery." We said, mm, "We have a problem here. What if one, two, three, four, five, six comes out of the lottery, national lottery? It will be huge news. Can we account for it using probability?" The answer is no. All, every draw has the same probability of coming out. But one, two, three, four, five, six is very, very interesting, even if you didn't play. Two, f two four, six, eight, uh, ten, twelve would be interesting as well, but less. Again, probability is the same. But we have an intuition that complexity is not is very really low, but slightly larger than for one, two, three, four, five, six. And I did an experiment. 
I proposed to people, I offered uh, already uh, field grid, grid for free. I said, okay, pick one and, uh, and bet on the national lottery. And no one picked the one, two, three, four, five, six. People were laughing. They said, oh, if you want to lose, you just <laughs> do that one. Okay. Uh, and so... Uh, they you should actually play on it because yes. if it never comes out, you will be the only one the only winner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you want to, to maximize, but uh, people would say... So the point that they are make a correct estimate of the probability in that case. The, you know Paris. Paris is more or less 14 kilometers wide. And winning at the lottery is the same as finding the right millimeter. So you have your one euro coin. You put it put it on the edge, on the diameter of Paris, hoping you are you have the right millimeter. That's the probability of winning at the national lottery. If people were aware of this, they wouldn't play. Okay. So all comes from an illusion that more complex um, uh, combinations are more likely. Uh, with one, two, three, four, five, six, they, yeah, they do have the correct ex estimate because it's unique. Uh, so it uh, gave us the idea that the perceived probability comes from an expectedness, which is the difference between complexity that is expected and complexity that is observed. Complexity uh, which is expected for a lottery is the same for all combinations. The one which is observed is the one that uh, gives the minimum description x of the actual outcome. And uh, in the case of dog bites man, dog bites man, it's not interesting. Mm, are you sure it's not interesting if a dog bites a man? What if the man is François Hollande in France? Ah, that becomes very interesting. You say, okay, that's because the probability of a, 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 a dog biting François Hollande is very low. Okay, I say, what's the probability of a, a dog biting a man whose social security number is this? Probability is the same as biting François Hollande. But it's totally uninteresting. The point is that the complexity of a, 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 a uh, a dog biting this man is complex. If it is lottery, you call, call it a, a probability. Then, then you have to, you have a minus, you have to subtract the complexity of the situation. In the case of François Hollande, he's very, the simplest guy in France, maybe, <laughs> for, for, uh, for people of our age, for other people, maybe not. Um, uh, it might be Katy Perry. Uh, Katy Perry, do you know who Katy Perry is? Why? Because I had a problem with my students. They said, I, I didn't know who Katy Perry was. She has uh, the, uh, 90 million followers on Twitter. So I guess for young people, she's much more famous than François Hollande. Whatever. Okay, so in this case, uh, in the case of François Hollande, this quantity is very small and uh, unexpectedness unexpected uh, is high. In the case of the social security number, I have to give all the information for the social security number, and this will be even negative. So it will be uh, pathological to have a news such as, you know what, a dog has bitten a man whose social security number is, and you give it. Uh, if you do it, people bring you to the hospital because it's pathological. So news, what we call information, depends on difference between complexity uh, of gen generation here and description there. So uh, I, I had an example. So this, I came to Bucharest in 95, and I was thinking of something. I, I saw a bus coming. It was a bus I was taking every day. Line 62, uh, pa 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 Paris, this bus, uh, a bit older than that one, but it was a bus 62. I said, well, what happens to me? How is it possible? It happens that uh, at that time, Bucharest was buying uh, all the bus lines from everywhere in Europe. And they had uh, bought all, all buses from the 62 line in Paris, in which they uh, changed all the buses. So uh, 
it was hard to, hard to generate from my point of view because I didn't know that uh, possibility of buying by uh, bus lines. So I didn't know that. Though it was hard to generate for me. And it was simple to describe. Why? Because it was a bus I was taking every day. If, if it had been another bus, uh, bus line in Paris, it well, would have been less interesting because there would have been more uh, complexity. Complexity would be larger. So I'm a, I am almost done. I will skip this. Uh, too bad, because I have to skip uh, the story about Angelina Jolie. But uh, this is it. I am concluding. So the, there is good news and bad news in my story about the definition of information and the fact that it can be used to describe what's going on in nature. So uh, the good news is that, uh, no, I start with the bad news. <laughs> Bad news is that we need an observer. You cannot talk when information with, you don't have an observer because complexity is measured from the perspective of an observer. Uh, otherwise, it's I don't know what it is. Uh, I'm not sure. I, in this case, you cannot talk when information in an objective way. That's a bad news. There is a good news, which is that the observer ne needs not be a human being. It needs not be a scientist. A ribosome can be a, 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 an observer. So w w where is the complexity drop when a ribosome is reading a codon? Ah, good question. You asked it uh, to me in a taxi when we came. Uh, what is the expected complexity for a ribosome reading a codon? There are 64 possible different codons. So it's uh, five, uh, six bits. So complexity, expected complexity is six bits. When the reading has been performed, it's, it's done, it's zero bit. So you have a, 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 the information. So if you say, OK, uh, the, the problem ribosome is not to read the codon, but to decide which amino acid to, to find, so then you have, um, uh, it's less than six bits because you have uh, uh, only 20 amino acids, so you can perform different computations depending on what you call before and after. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about the ribosome, you have to call you to tell about what are the perception abilities. So that when you have an observer, you have to decide what is observed. And if what is observed is not the code in itself, but just a decision about the amino acid, will not be 6 bits, but log into uh, 20, which uh, less than that, 5 bits. Okay. But you can say there is complexity drop. That's the only way I can see that you can unify all this uh, situation in which you want to call about information, you want to, to talk about information. So the good news is that we can extend the definition to non-human observers as long as there is a reading operation. That's crucial. So the story I told, I told about the schemata, you need, in this case, I don't know the observer. We, we, observer, we, we wouldn't be a human uh, scientist. But in many cases, nature is observing itself. Okay. And this, in this case, you can talk about information. Uh, so information is something which is that lives long. Information is something which is must be read to exist. Well, must be read, no. Which, uh, uh, because you can distinguish between, between actual and uh, potential information. When you buy a book, you know there is potential information in it. If you open it, you can uh, make it actual information. If you open it and it's just random uh, uh, liberation, you say, OK, I, I shouldn't have paid for that book. So uh, you have difference between potential and actual information, but at least in principle, information, you call it information if it can be read by something. Uh, uh, the trophic network, I call it information because it is read not only by scientists, but also by uh, invading species. Information can be defined as complexity drop, and this captures uh, all the cases I encountered uh, uh, to, up to now. And uh, so I dropped it. Uh, no, I, I so, so think you, so. Yes. Can you repeat what's the 
The symbols are, is it CW? CW, okay. Uh, that's expected complexity, but in most cases for human beings, that amounts to causal complexity. Because that's only for human beings. When you have something which is surprising, which is you expected another complexity, you are uh, performing abduction and you find causes and you find for the causal complexity. So uh, you, uh, and this is computable. But that's a slightly different uh, computation. When you are um, uh, computing causal complexity, you uh, imagine that uh, the event has been produced uh, under the constraints of the world as you know it, or as you suppose it is. Okay. That's why you would say that a child is never surprised, because uh, children live in a magical uh, magical words in which everything is possible. By the way, we know it's not true. Even a newborn has constraints about the world and uh, is surprised when the uh, same object is, uh, appears at two different locations. So not everything is possible. The older you grow, the more you know, the more constraints you put on the world, and the, the more likely you are to be surprised. So that's causal complexity. So you have two different machines. Uh, both of them are embedded in your, in your brain if you are a human being, but you play two roles. When you, there is a coincidence, for instance, you say, okay, I know the two events are independent. Though, causal complexity, I have to play it twice. But if the two events are alike, I can use one of them to describe the other. So I can spare bits at the description level. In the case of the bus, I have constraints in my world my favorite bus cannot be in Bucharest. That's, that makes sense causally. But when I see it, my mi minimal description of the bus, it's not that's my, my usual bus. So minimal description, if I forget about cause, causal constraints, it's very short. And if I take into account causal constraints, it's huge. How can I make, uh, how, uh, have I been transported to Paris? Uh, why I was closing my eyes, okay? So I, I don't know, I, the cause of complexity is huge. I couldn't imagine that, so it was explained to me later that Bucharest, the city of Bucharest, had uh, bought buses from Genova, uh, no, Genova, no, uh, Geneva. Geneva, Geneva, uh, from uh, Paris, from other places in Europe, because there were old buses that were s sold uh, together. So that's causal complexity, and the, the discrepancy between both makes unexpectedness for human beings. In the case of ribosomes or walls or whatever, we don't care about causal complexity, it's just expected complexity. The difference between uh, um, the, the wh what you expect and wh wh what you uh, get. Uh, th that was the point. So you have a very nice, uh, that's my favorite, uh, formula, which is when you want to, so you don't define information from probability, you do the converse. So if you invert this formula, you would say, so if it is, I call it unexpectedness, then the converse would be uh, P is 2 to minus U, which means that you define unexpectedness first, and you derive probability from it. So be careful because this is ex post probability. So don't, don't attempt to, to, to verify that it sums to one because uh, you, you would never have um, uh, um, disjoint events. Okay, so it's pointless to, to sum the, it's for one event ex post, you decide whether it was improbable or not depending on you. So this is formula which is uh, uh, which applies to many aspects of cognition, of human cognition. This is it. Uh, I should show it now. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I was very talkative. Okay. The, the, there's a point you made towards the beginning that 
using dynamic systems doesn't make sense if your system is slow or at, at large time scales? Yes, uh, I shouldn't have say, phrase it that way because um, you have dynamical systems that are all time scales. Yes, but in the case of life, I compare it to the time scale of individuals. Okay. So the lifespan of individuals, if you multiply it by 1,000 or so, uh, it all depends what you are paying attention to. But the point is that well, many, uh, when you zoom in, you can see the dynamics of the decision, for instance, the population. If you zoom out, it's just flip. Uh, yeah, but it's still dynamics. It's, it's binary. It's a Dynamics, you could take a computer, computer like this, you zoom in into what's going on in circuits, and you can describe it in a dynamical way. Oh, I saw one electron going on there. Oh, it, it was a, a repulsive with these other particles, uh, and, and, and you make sense of what's going on in circuits. But when you have a bug in your program, and someone says, oh, I can explain the bug. This electron came th this way, and then it was... Uh, for, um, okay, preventing from going that way because there was another particle coming. That's pointless. Yeah, okay. you have the right um, uh, level of description. Yeah, so that's um, that's not okay. It's complementary. You, you decide what is best. So I just want to say that it's not in contradiction with the dynamical description. It's just uh, a different one, which can coexist with the dynamical description uh, whenever it's uh, the both are relevant. I would say they are rarely relevant on the same scale. Mm -hmm. So in, in, when you are dealing with dynamical uh, descriptions, most, most of the time you have attractors and systems which are me memoryless. Here we are dealing with uh, long-term memory. So systems that uh, if you make a right instead of a, a left, it will have long-term uh, consequences during centuries or millennia. Uh, which is not typical of dynamical systems, mm -hmm. which are the attractor, you make a left or right, and it will be erased by the fact that you are attracted to the closest attractor. When we say that uh, the walls can read the traffic uh, network, or uh, read the zone can read the set of information behind the world read the, uh, the traffic uh, network. Not the world, not the no, physical. Not the world. No, no, the species. Not the, the physical ribosome. The, the point that's a, that's a species. Yeah. So uh, the way I presented this story is very rough because uh, mm. I'm not an ecologist. Uh, Cédric uh, would um, explain it in more who describe the species wolf mm -hmm. as an, a richer observer than I can do for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only thing I can say is that the species wolf, wolf invade or doesn't invade the, eco the ecosystem, in which case only one bit is read. Mm -hmm. But you can have a fine-grained decision by the species wolf, which be to, to be present at a certain level of trophic uh, they have, uh, I, I said it's just a graph, it's not. They are yeah, they in trophic uh, graphs, Networks, they are able to say they are, they are levels, they are positioned, they are uh, central or not central species. So decision will be more fine grained than what I said. Mm. Okay. But anyway, it's, it's a species in this case. Mm. So when you say that the wolf reads the topic level, does it actually mean that it checks the different? But individual wolves try to survive, make babies, and if uh, and you have at a dynamical level, you will have uh, oscillations and so on, and eventually the wolf is still present or not, and so it's as if the species was sensitive to topology of the of the uh, of the trophic life for my description, or for the specialist's description, it would be that the wolf has been able to read part of the trophic light, which is a relevant part, uh, the insertion uh, locus of the trophic uh, network, maybe, 
because maybe the world is not concerned with what's going on with mushrooms or whatever. So maybe if you are a specialist, you can describe it in different way. So it's uh, eventually uh, at the end you have a meta observer who, who is uh, the scientist. Uh, same for ribosomes. Uh, before we knew about uh, ribo ribosomes, we had no story to tell. But uh, uh, you could say information only exists in uh, as any scientific uh, notion that exists in human brains. But we are a meta observer. The point is that you have a proximal observer who need, doesn't need to be a human being. So it seems to us to be a, a relevant uh, description. And the, the most uh, convincing case to me is the Darwinian uh, story. The Darwinian story only means something at the information level. Everything else is not Darwinian theory. Darwinian theory is about survival of schemata. You are not dealing with survival of species. You are not dealing with species don't, do not exist in biology. You are not dealing with survival of individuals because they don't survive. You are not dealing with anything else than information. And what is information in the case of Darwinian theory? Schemata. So in this case, it's even in, impossible to phrase Darwinian theory correctly in other terms than in terms of, um, of uh, schemata and information. Mm -hmm. Unless you are interested in something else, which is not Darwin theory, which is a Fisherian uh, uh, as well, uh, uh, population dynamics and things like that, which is different. You could say that uh, I can predict which population will invade locally and so on, which is not Darwin selection. Darwin selection is much uh, longer term. So uh, w that was a base camp. And we decided uh, to try to uh, use the same trick to uh, change uh, the perspective on other uh, other situations like uh, ecology, like uh, mimetics, like uh, and um, and of course you understood that the story about complexity drop comes from another domain, which is uh, human communication and relevance in human communication. And it happens that it, uh, it could uh, fit to uh, what we needed to talk about information in biology. And a long way to go. <laughs> it's certain. Oh, yeah. Some, some readers say that uh, they are convinced uh, by everything but uh, the ecology situation. <laughs> 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 or, uh, yeah, why not? Okay, maybe, uh, as you say, there is a long way until we have convincing stories to tell about ecology, about uh, memetics, uh, uh, about m and maybe other domains uh, in which uh, information, uh, this way of uh, talking about information would be uh, appropriate. But when you talk about uh, tran uh, transmitting information, uh, so this is compatible with the Shannonian uh, definition. It's compatible with surprise. This idea was about surprise. So every bit of information, zero or one, is surprise. If you have a more complex coding, you have a... And so the, the uh, maximum of entropy is a maximum of average surprise. But uh, this is another, uh, you are embedded in a story of transmission and you are dealing with average uh, use of your uh, transmission channel, which is quite specific. But uh, the, the basis is exactly the same, which is surprise. Coding, surprise. Uh, okay, and uh, convolvular complexity seems to be the, the correct concept here, and not Bennett. <laughs> uh, why? Uh, Bennett is very interesting. Uh, at least scientifically, uh, the point is no one is able to measure Bennett. I can imagine that ants are able to measure compl complexity. I don't know how yeah, ants can measure. It's already difficult to measure. The time they exchange yeah. it's, uh, information, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's like Bennett. Ooh, ah. uh, the, the more the that the, the, the information is complex, uh, the more the, 
take time to explain it. No, I'm not sure you because <laughs> Bennett, the point of uh, logical depth is to say that it's uh, time and, uh, needed for the, pro uh, the shortest program to run. Yeah. In this case, uh, the correlation is with the size of the program, not the time needed to run it. So in all these cases, the, the time is negligible. Yeah. So I'm not sure I, anyone has any idea how much time you need to uh, to run. So in the, I don't remember what it was, the ants were well, there later, I guess. Yes. Here, the, what is given is an estimate of the complexity, uh, static complexity. The time you need to read a program that say L, 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 or a program you need to say L, R, L, L, R, L, uh, uh, usually people say this one would be shorter than that one. Because in this case, you should just say print. And in that case, you must say, okay, uh, repeat up to, uh, repeat uh, six times uh, L, 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 would be slightly longer. So the lo logical depth of this structure is slightly long, uh, longer than that one, which is the reverse of what we observe. So ants are not measuring uh, logical depth, they are measuring uh, complexity, from what complexity. There are two columns with numbers there. What is the second column? The uh, second is number of experiments. Ah. Maybe. So the average of the number of experiments that we yes. see. Yes. So you would expect that the, the the reliability depends on the number of experiments. Yeah, yeah, okay. so Here you have uh, 12. Be somewhat less reliable. Yes. Oh. I guess it's a long time to <laughs> perform all these experiments. Any, so yeah. Yes, lots of all that have to do. Lots of you have a lot of uh, PhD students to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a follow up in this. Uh, uh, they had uh, another maze which is like this. So the entrance is there, and you have. 30 possible locations. Mm -hmm. And then they propose they put food somewhere. And uh, my memory is that the closest locations were uh, simpler in terms of communication time. Mm -hmm. But at some point, they did something uh, a la Shannon, saying, OK, the, the number 10 and the number 20, we have a food much more often. Okay. And then they could observe that uh, the ants were adopting a uh, uh, Shannon Fano code, which was that this one and that one had a shorter code, uh, shorter than, than for their o o other, o other locations. Mm. It's crazy. Mm. So they are, uh, they are not only uh, Kolmogorovian ants, they are also Shannonian ants. I don't remember it, whether it was the same species. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we don't know about uh, primates, for instance. I don't know anyone that uh, did this kind of experiments with primates. They might be less good. Because Possibly. Because the ants, that's mostly what they do is to eat. Mm -hmm. To forage and to uh, uh, human beings are very bad uh, at uh, indication, indicating locations. So when yeah, people if you ask somebody yeah. to explain, can you show yeah. me? It so if it is, a, you make a right and then a right and then a right. It's easier uh, both for the for, for the talker and the listener, but uh, otherwise um, we are very bad. When people say uh, language evolved for interchange and, uh, and information, I'm just laughing because uh, obviously it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Not with uh, that meaning of information. Uh, language evolved for a, a changing a complexity drop. Yes, people are very sensitive to complexity drops, and it's even a reflex. You can 
you feel obliged to mention uh, complexity drops to anyone, even even if you don't. Uh, once I saw a, a plane was still in the sky. So I, I looked for someone to talk to, to talk about it. I couldn't find anyone. So the, the plane said yes. I was coming back. It was uh, beginning of the evening. It was dark, but not night. And I'm living in the south of Paris, and uh, there are planes uh, coming to, to Orly. And uh, when the night is coming, they are uh, turning their light on. And you can see sometimes several planes in a row. You can see four of them, because they are uh, lining, uh, they are in a queue waiting for them. Because they are far away. You, 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 at the beginning, you believe they are uh, still in, uh, in the sky, but after a while, you see that they are moving. So I was uh, coming back to my my place, and uh, so one of them, oh, a plane, so it's not moving, well, because it's far away, it's not moving, it's not moving, <laughs> so it's, <laughs> well, it's not moving at all. <laughs> yes, it was, I guess, in 99, or I, I can know the more or less the date. And then I connected it to a piece of information that was given to me uh, on the rain morning, that's the uh, uh, comet Alibop was uh, coming. But I couldn't imagine that I would see it in, uh, in uh, it was almost a day, it was just the beginning of the night. I wouldn't believe it was so bright that I could see it that way and uh, mix it with the, with the plane. It was a comet. But uh, before I, I, I made sense of it, and then what, what did I do then? I, I, I arrived at home, I remember this now. I wrote an email to uh, my department saying I apologize for uh, sending uh, to spamming uh, the whole department, but this is too much, and I, I, I told my story. So you have the reflex of communicating when you have a complexity drop. That mm -hmm. I can't what was the complexity in this case? It was very, very huge causal complexity. So how can you explain that a, bra a plane is sitting in the, in the sky? Uh, uh, half Okay, very good point. So the question is about uh, what you call quality of information, mm -hmm. or the, some people talk about the meaning of information, mm -hmm. or what the information is about. So in a case of when you deal with events, it's not the same to say that uh, a guy has, uh, uh, has lost 10 euros this morning, or a guy or uh, a guy has, lo has lost his, his life this morning. It's not the same event. Mm -hmm. So I was in the Bahnhof, uh, in the train station, and some uh, a guy uh, died. It's not the same news that a guy lost 10 euros. Uh, no, okay, in this case you could claim that the probability is not the same. Give me something that happens to you only once in life. Uh, uh, found a, a four-leaf clover. Okay. You find a four-leaf, it never happened to me. So I know people uh, uh, once. So it's about this. You lose your life once in life, and you find a four-leaf clover once in life. Okay. But the, 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 the news is not the same, and you would say the quality is not the same. Because uh, it's more emotional to uh, a story about... Uh, is it your point or not? Mm. No. So I just answer my question and then I answer <laughs> yours. <laughs> uh, well, at, at the beginning of Shannon's uh, famous paper, uh, the second paragraph, he explains that he doesn't care about semantics. He just cares about probability. But as a human being, we do care about semantics. An event about uh, lost euros or lost lives is not the same. But this theory of complexity drop is totally compatible with this second dimension. It even is a way of adding up complexity bits with emotional e emotion bits. And I can prove it. Imagine that someone uh, died in the university. You don't know that person. But you know that he happens to work in the same building. But you know you don't know her. 
she works in the same building. Or she wor works next building. Or she works three blocks away. Or she works in the other location of the, of the university in Brussels. That's not the same emotion. Or if we tell you that uh, she happens to have the same birthday as you, more emotional. She has the same first name as you, more emotional. Because minimum description length is smaller. So when, in case of distance, the location where uh, uh, her office is, is smaller. And you can control emotion just by controlling the complexity of the event. So you can exchange complexity bits with emotional bits. That's strange. The all other point is that you are computing your emotions. Emotions are not something that happens. It's computed. Your, your brain is computing your, your emotions. And you, you feel them, anyway. This morning, I thought that uh, Bob Dylan was, had died. Because I was talking a lot about Bob Dylan, I said, oh, he died. I had a lot of emotions. <laughs> I, I, is it real? Is it real that he got the Nobel Prize? Yes. yes. It's not I, uh, because I was not very well. Uh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> my, my causal complexity has some problem with it. It's still a, a big event because uh, it doesn't make sense of this. I, I'm still in need of explanation. This was not your point. Uh, Vas-y, dis-moi. Non, 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 si, ça répond en partie. Mais, en partie. Euh, il faut que je réfléchisse et que je la formulerai, euh, je formulerai ma question. Mais je pense qu'elle est, est importante. Mm -hmm. euh, je la formulerai euh, par mail. Je sais, ok. Sûr, ok. Mais euh, pour l'instant, ce n'est pas très clair dans ma tête, mais je pense que ça va le devenir. D'accord. So, the, my, my story was to to try to say that uh, complexity drop is relevant to the use of, uh, of the word information when you apply it to nature, and that applying the concept of information to nature is relevant as well. So it's a two-step story in which uh, I am saying two things. One of them is information. The other one is definition of information. 